Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Today, we're going to start our lecture 24. OK, so before talking about the last lecture in, uh, in, our, in our class, so let's first review um, our previous lecture. OK, so in our last lecture, we basically cover the channel capacity, right, and also the homework 8. So for the channel capacity, uh, so we start from talking about the discrete time additive wide Gaussian noise channel, of course, with the input power constraint, right? And uh, so in this case, so basically we can show that the capacity is given by this formula, that's per channel use, right? Notice, no, notice the, the unit here, right? So every channel use, we can transmit this number of bits, right? And um, and uh, the power constraint here is p, and the sigma square is basically the variance of the noise, right? And we can, we may imagine we may consider p over uh, sigma square is the basically the signal to noise ratio or SNR, right? And then we extend this result to the continuous time add additive wide Gaussian noise uh, channel, right? Be careful here, right? So the way we got here is basically. We use the Nyquist sampling theorem, right? We say, okay, we sample the the we sample the signal uh, by using a sampling rate of two times w, where w is the bandwidth per second, right? And then after the sampling, so we can use uh, the capacity of the discrete time AWGN channel to obtain this result, right? And from this result, we can see that so the bandwidth appears both in front and uh, uh, here, right? And the p is the power constraint per second, and uh, overall we can imagine we can consider the overall p over w and not that will be the signal to noise ratio, right? So uh, the unit here is bit per every second, right? And then we give some analysis for this formula. Uh, <clears throat> the the first case is that we let p go to infinity, but w is fixed, right? And then c can be approximately can be approximate by uh, by this formula, right? And uh, so we call this band the bandwidth limited regime, right? Because if p goes to large, so this quantity is limited by the bandwidth, right? And clearly, when b becomes infinity, and this quantity will go to zero. Although the rate, I mean, the speed will be pretty slow, right? Because there's a log term here. And uh, on the other hand. So if we let the bandwidth go to infinity, but the power is fixed, so this is slightly more interesting. So we can see in this case, the capacity can be approximately can be approximated by this formula, 1.44 multiply p over n naught, right? So basically, w got cancelled, and in this case, so we can see the capacity will go uh, go up linearly with the power, right? And this regime is called power limited regime. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> later on we introduce the concept of the bandwidth efficiency and the power efficiency, right? So the bandwidth efficiency is defined as uh, some rate which is below capacity over the bandwidth, right? So, so the ba bandwidth efficiency, the unit of that is a bit per second per hertz, and uh, the power efficiency is defined nothing but the uh, EB over N naught, right? And uh, the relation between the bandwidth efficiency and the power efficiency is given by this formula, right? And if we, you know, we can see that uh, on the right hand side, so this is the increasing function of uh, this is the increasing function of r, right? So if we let r goes to uh, goes to zero, and then basically we can get the minimum uh, the minimum eb over n naught, which is negative one uh, about one point six dB. Right, so that is the minimum required EB over N naught for reliable communications here. Right, so we didn't define reliable communication very rigorously, but uh, uh, but intuitively speaking, re reliable communications basically means that the error will go to zero as the length of the code word. Right, basically you can think, imagine uh, this is like zero error communication. Right, but it's a symptotic zero error. Okay, and here is a plot of the bandwidth efficiency versus the power efficiency, and we can see that we have a capacity bound here, right? And uh, so, what we design practice is try our best to approach capacity, 
right? So the technique we use to approach capac channel capacity is uh, is uh, a so-called channel coding, right? But we didn't give a very uh, uh, detailed discussion for the channel coding there. Okay, so this is uh, what we uh, discussed in our previous lecture. Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> in today's lecture, so it is um, our lecture number 24, right? So in this lecture, so we're going to talk about the chapter 10. So that is the last chapter that uh, will be covered in this class, right? So in this chapter, it's not extremely related to the actual transmission, right? So this <coughs> chapter is about, um, is about source coding, okay? Right, so <clears throat> if you remember in the in the very first uh, block diagram we introduced in this class, so we can see that so before the transmission, so what do we do is that we have a source information, right? For example, it could be a speech signal, it could be a image signal, so it could be continuous time, could be discrete time, right? And uh, so for simplicity, let's assume now it's a discrete time source, right? It's just, you know, some, some numbers or some symbols, right? And uh, so for the first thing we do is that we need to do a source coding, right? Which is happening here. And then, so we give some structure um, information and then we do the transmission. So we basically, we mainly covered uh, here and here. In uh, here in this class, right? The encoder, channel encoder, and the module. Sorry, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't um, uh, discuss much for the channel encoder and decoder, but we mainly focus on the module later and the D module later, right? And uh, on the receiver side, so we need to after this, uh, you know, the network uh, uh, st uh, protocol stacks, and then in the end we need to do. Uh, source decoder, right? And then we get the, 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 the aimed information that we need want to transmit, right? So in this lecture, in this chapter, so basically we're going to focus on this part, source, uh, source coder and source decoder, right? So this is called the source coding. In other words, so the source coding basically means compression, right? For example, if we want to transmit uh, an image, uh, and uh, if there are lots of blue sky in the image, right? So we may not want to transmit the raw image directly, right? Because in the blue sky, there are lots of redundancy, right? It's basically, so the same number will repeat multiple times, right? Or very similar number will repeat multiple times, right? So if we transmit those numbers directly without doing anything, so it will be a waste of our bandwidth, right? So yeah, for example, you know, if we have a, you know, we have an image with lost, with the identical blue sky there, right? So instead of transmitting all the pixels there, we just need to transmit one pixel of the blue sky, right? And then tells the, the receiver that, okay, for the rest of our image, they are all the same, right? So that's a one way to do the compression, right? In this case, we do not need to transmit lots of numbers, but only need to transmit one number and tells the, the receiver or the sync node that, okay, so this number will be repeated, right? So this, you know, this is kind of a compression, right? We, can, we have a very big image, then we compress it into a very small one, right? So in this, in this chapter, so basically, we're going to discuss the, 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 the most fundamental theory and ideas for the, the, for the compression algorithm. Okay, okay, so let's uh, get started. <clears throat> so in today's lecture, so we're going to uh, talk about uh, the following topics. The first one is the measure of information. Okay, so basically here we're going to talk about, again, so we're going to talk more seriously about information theory. In particular, we're going to focus on entropy. Okay, and then second, we're going to talk about the source coding theorem. 
or in the most rigorous way. So this in this part we talk about the lossless source coding uh, theory, which means that there's no loss, right? No or no error there uh, when we want to do the decoding. Okay, and if we have time, so we're going to talk about Huffman coding. Okay, so this part maybe, so we're going to talk about, we'll, we may start in this lecture and then continue in our next lecture. Okay, okay, very good. So that is the uh, idea for today. Okay, so. <clears throat> so let's get started. <clears throat> so the first uh, topic is the measure of information. How should how can we measure information? Okay, so so before talking about the measure of information, let's start with talking about so what kind of the what kind of sources we want to consider in this lecture, right? So we don't consider arbitrary source actually. So what uh, we care about is the simplest source, so which is called the discrete time. No, sorry, it's it's called discrete memoryless source, right? Or in general, we denote it by DMS and uh, S P S. Okay, so yeah, let's explain what does this mean, right? So this uh, the first S here is basically the random variable, and this P S is the P M F of this random variable, right? So normally, we did we denote this as that. So we pick a we put a capital S there, right? So, so this S is uh, capital S, and the same as this, and this S is a lowercase S, right? So there, there are lots of S's here, so let's be a little bit more careful. And we define the alphabet of the source as follows. So, so this is a set, right? So I just use the under bar there to indicate. Uh, it is actually a set. It's not a variable, right? So, so this basically means the all the possible values of the random variable s, right? And uh, all the all the possible values are s zero, s one, and until s capital m minus one. And we can think that there are in total uh, uh, capital m uh, number of messages, right? So this is the alphabet. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the meaning. So now we have one random variable, right? So the meaning of uh, discrete memory source is as follows. So at each uh, time instant, so the source. Generate, generates a sample s. So this s is uh, basically the random variable uh, shown here, right? So generate sample s. So this s is a random variable, right? Independently. So this independently basically means that it's over time, right? Or generated in ID fashion, right? Independently from the alpha that as according according to the probability distribution which is given by here right so this is nothing but according to ps and uh, sk so sk is basically a realization this basically means that the probability that 
S capital S equals to SK, right? And we use a shorthand notation here. We denote this as PK later, right? And K here is from zero until capital M minus one, right? So this is just the, the PMF of the random variable S, okay? So, so basically the meaning of uh, a discrete memory source is that at each time instant, so uh, the source will just randomly generate a realization of uh, uh, S, basically, right? So, or, you know, because you know, it's, uh, the source is a function of, of time, right? So we may also understand, uh, understand this um, as the following way. So in other words, the discrete memory source, so S, P, S, right? So that generate, generates an IID random process, right? We you know this as SI? Right, so we may uh, understand this like in each time slot, right? So, um, so the, the value will follow a random variable si, right? That, so that is a random process, okay? And this i here is basically is a time index. We can even understand this in that way. So of course, with the probability distribution, that si will just distribute it as p s i s. Right, so that is um, you know <clears throat> the definition of the discrete memory source, right? And you may you may think this is definitely the simplest source, uh, right? That existed, and uh, so in this class we'll uh, we'll mainly focus on this uh, source, and in the la very last part, so we're gonna extend it to the continuous time uh, source. Okay. Okay, so now let's uh, go back to our the question, right? The matter of information here, the, the matter of information, right? So given, I say we're given this kind of source, and uh, how could we? So how how can we measure the information, or how much information is contained? in the source S, right? So we talked very briefly in our very first lecture uh, in this class. So <clears throat> basically, so the meaning of information is basically uncertainty, right? So yeah, this is the, so actually this, is a, this came from Klaus Shannon. Uh, in 1984, his seminal paper. So this, uh, you know, this matter of information is is really novel, right? So he introduced the concept that so <clears throat> so information should be measured as the uncertainty uncertainty of the outcome. Of the outcomes, so it basically means that, so, so how much you are not sure about the result, right? If you're really not sure about the result, it means that the information is pretty high. Okay, so let's see. Let's give an example and see the meaning of it, right? So consider example that. So we have a alphabet which has only negative one and the plus one, right? <clears throat> and the, the probability uh, distrib the PMF for this is that so we you know the first one is P negative one. Let's say P is P negative one and P positive one, right? And let's consider uh, two cases, right? The first case is that let's say if the probability that um, S equals to one, or let's say 
yeah, let's just use the shorthand notation. Right? Let's say the probability of one is one, and the probability of negative one is zero, right? Because the summation of these two has to be uh, one, right? So if that, so let's see what does that mean here, right? So if the probability of one is one, so we know that the source is one, right? There's no any chance that the source is zero, right? So it basically means that we're really sure about the outcome, right? So if we're really sure about the outcome, right? If somebody tells me that you're gonna get a one, so did you know anything additional? No, right? Because I know that the outcome of that is just one. There's no any other possibility, right? It means that in this case, there's no any information, right? It means that no information, right? Because it didn't gain any knowledge, right? Okay, on the other hand, let's say, how about we reduce this probability a little bit to so 0 0.9? And then, so the probability that the outcome is negative 1 is 0 0.1, right? How about in this case, right? So let's say if I tell you that the outcome is 1, let's say in this case, so do you think you'll gain lots of information, right? Not much, right? Because 90% of the chance it is a 1, right? If, I, if somebody tell me that it's a 1, so did I gain a lot of information? Not really, right? So we gain less information because we're 90% sure that it is a 1, right? So, so or we say it's a less surprise result, right? So uncertainty and surprise, you know, they're kind of similar, right? So if it's less surprise, it means that so we're, we're gaining less information, right? But if somebody tells you that the result is the negative one, so it is really surprising, right? So this is a more surprise case. So, or it means that in this case, we gain more information, right? Because it's only 10% of the probability that it'll be a negative one, right? But if it actually happened, then you know you actually gain more information, right? Because it's unlikely. Okay. So <clears throat> yeah, this is basically some intuition of um, of the matter of information, right? In other words, we can think in this way, right? So basically, so the quantity that we care the most is actually one over uh, p s k, right? So which means that so if this guy is large, right? For example, in this case, so this guy is basically 10, right? But in this case, this guy is 10 over 9, right? So if this guy is large, so it basically means that the uncertainty of this actually happen will be large, larger, right? So in this case, so <clears throat> so we gain more information. Right, so if something unlikely happened, but if and it's actually happened, it means that we gain more information, right? So that is basically uh, the idea here, right? So actually, in order to measure, so how many bits that can be used to describe it, to describe this event, so actually, it is used the logarithmic function, right? So we define the logarithmic function so we denote this by uh, i of pk right that is equals nothing but log 2 of 1 over pk right so <clears throat> So this function uh, is also called self-information. Right, so the meaning of that, so this is basically the amount of
information gained after the occurrence of the outcome, right? So if this event happened, we say we gain this number of bits of information, right? That is the basically uh, the matter of uh, <coughs> the matter of information for this particular event, right? PK. Okay, very good. And uh, and actually, so this log rhythmic function is actually not from only definition, right? Actually, you know, by using some axiom, so we can actually show that, right, rigorously. So this uh, this has to be the case, right? So we're not going to cover that in class because that is very lengthy derivation. But uh, but I think I, I, I want to emphasize one of the most important things here. Right. So, so as I said, right. So this result was derived by using some of the axioms, right. So what are the axioms, right? So axiom is basically a kind of like something that everybody agrees, right. So we need to, we cannot start from nowhere, right. We need to agree on somewhere. So that is our ground, and then we start from there to derive uh, whatever uh, uh, it follows, right. So, so one of the most important thing here. We need to agree is that so if we have two events there, right? Like in this case, S is negative one plus one, and if the probability of them is the same, half, right? So if negative one happened with half of, of the probability and the negative and the plus one happened also with half of the probability, then how many bits we need to use to represent this event? Or you, may, you may think, right? So intuitively, it's actually one bit, right? One bit is like, okay, if zero is negative one, and it's, plus, it's a one, then it means uh, plus one, right? So if both of them has an equal probability, so we say we definitely need one bit to represent the information, or the matter of this source is one bit, right? That's a common ground that we have to start with, and then we can derive this very nice result, right? I'll stop here uh, without going into the details, but uh, but uh, the message I want to convey here is that so actually this self information uh, was derived instead of a just magic definition, right? Yeah, because you you may imagine that so this is so this basically represents number of bits that we're gonna gain after you know watching the outcome, right, it's kind of magic. Okay, so now let's uh, see some properties of this IPK. Uh, properties of IPK. Okay, so the first property is that, so this guy is always bigger than or equal to zero, right? So this should be pretty straightforward because here, so we know this should be uh, less than uh, less than or equal to one, right? Therefore, so the minimum number of this would be zero, right? So it has to be bigger than zero, okay? And uh, the second property is that when pk is one, so then IPK is zero, right? Basically, you know, if we are sure that SK is a one, I mean, SK will happen with the probability of one, then we cannot gain any new knowledge, right? We don't gain any information because we know that it will happen for sure, right? So, so next one is uh, is slightly non-trivial. So here we consider we consider a group of a set of uh, random variables. Or a set of these sources, it could be over time, right? So S1 equals to SK1. So I you know notation I use I think is slightly different from the book, just for you know it's for the easy of the writing there. Otherwise there will be so many uh, subscripts, right? Uh, so I need to use a lower case here. Two 
um, this is S2, S3, so yeah, let's um, dot 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 until S L equals to S K L, right? And now let's say then the amount of information. delivered meaning that after watching the outcome is given by as follows right so now this i so because we have more than one random variables here so inside of i we should consider a join distribution right which is the probability of s1 is sk1 s2 is sk2 and uh, sl is skl right so what do you think that will be right so let's uh, let's derive it see what uh, it can be can be right so basically the definition of this is log 2 1 over p s1 sk1 s2 sk2 until uh, sl skl right so basically uh, so yeah because of what we're considering is a dms right so we know all the random variables here are independent right so uh, by, by saying that so what we have is as follows so basically that equals to log 2 and uh, so the probability they're independent right so we can break the terms like this s1 equals sk1 multiply s2 equals to sk2 multiply and then till 1 over probability sl equals to skl right so now we can break it right into a summation so log 2 1 over yeah, let's just use the, hand, the, the, the shorthand notation here, right? With, let's denote this as uh, pk1 time uh, plus log 1 over pk2 plus until log 2 1 over pkl, right? And uh, so if you recall, so the first term will be just i of... <coughs> pk1 and the second term is just i of pk2 and uh, until we have i of pkl right and uh, of course for each term this pk1 this shorthand notation means that so this is a probability that s1 equals to sk1 right just um, uh, remind you that right and uh, the important thing here <clears throat> is that we show that if we consider a set of source and uh, they're independent, uh, then so this guy will basically equals to the summation of the each individual term, right? So that is uh, pretty important. And you can imagine that so one of the reasons is from there all the sources are independent, and the other reason of this is basically. Um, the property of the log, right? So, so if inside is the multiplication, then outside, then it'll be a summation there. Okay, very good. Alrighty. Okay. So, uh, the next, <clears throat> next. So we're gonna consider the average of them, right? Now we just consider i of p k, or you know, the p k is the probability that s equals to s k, right? So how about we do an average of them, right? So. <clears throat> the average amount oh i don't want to use red let's change it back to blue so the average amount of <clears throat> information delivered is 
given by <clears throat> so we use a notation called hs where s is a variable or the source right so that is um, defined as closed so it's uh, basically the average of the self information ipk right it's uh, just the average of that and let's write everything more explicitly so basically get pk so i is uh, log one over pk okay and then we can you know take this uh, um, one over this out by using a negative sign so basically that will give you negative k from 0 to m minus 1 pk log pk okay that's it so <clears throat> so here actually so this is basically the concept of entropy so this h means entropy so the entropy of s is defined as this right so this is the entropy of our random variable s okay and uh, again so so this uh, uh, the meaning of the entropy so basically that is the measure of a random variable s right this is how much information that s can be contained okay and uh, and I said entropy is defined in this way, right? But actually, again, it is not defined in this way, right? Again, so this can be derived from some axioms, right? So which are some common beliefs, right? So, so if you, uh, you know, if you think this again, so so it's kind of uh, you know it's kind of magic, right? So so this basically uh, means you know how much information that is contained for a random variable of s or for a source of s right but so the measure of that here so if we use uh, so this if we use uh, log 2 here so the unit of that is actually in bits right so it means that so this is a unit okay so this means that so this would be the number of bits we need to represent a source, right? Which is kind of magic, right? So, but actually it was derived instead of, you know, we just define that and then, you know, suddenly it works, right? It's not like that. Okay, let's look at example to dig some deeper meaning of it, right? So let's uh, consider an example, let's say for a binary source. Right, binary source basically means that we only have uh, zero and one or two possible values, right? So, so before uh, the, the the previous case of negative one plus one is also an example of the binary source, right? Consider here p zero and p one. The summation of them is one, right? Only two possible values. So if we use the definition of the entropy, so we can basically write down the formula quite easily. So this equals to negative p0 log p0 uh, minus p1 log p1. Okay. So next is so because we know this relation, right? So we can basically uh, only use one variable to represent this formula. Right, like that okay then we can plot it as a function of p0 right so let's do that so if you do the plotting so it'll look something like this right here is the value of p0 and then here's 0 here is 1 because p0 can only take from 0 to 1 right so if we plot this function so let's say here's 1 so it will look like this Right, it should be symmetric okay so <clears throat> the key point here is that so remember this is our entropy right the key point here is that so it will be maximized at the point of 0 0.5 right so what does that mean 
right, this basically means that, let's say, consider two binary, I mean the binary case where in the negative one plus one, so it basically means that probability of S is one equals to probability that S uh, is negative one and equals the probability of S is one, so equals to half, right? So, and actually the entropy is maximized at this point, right? So that so this kind of you know coincides with our intuition, right? This basically means that so if it's a uni if the information is uniformly distributed, I mean if all the values are uniformly distributed, so this kind of source contains the maximum the max, maximum amount of information, right? Because we really have no idea so which one should you know which alphabet, which of the outcome. It will, it will be right because all of them are with equal probability. So there's no one, uh, you know, more preferable compared to the others, right? So in this kind of source, should contain the highest amount of, informa of information, or for this kind of source, it contains the highest amount of uncertainty, right? Because we're really unsure. So which one it will be, right? So. In this particular example, so if you know the probability is half or both symbols, so it basically means that we need at least one bit of information, right? So you can consider this as a common ground or the axiom uh, of information theory, right? So if two symbols and each of them you know happened with half of the probability. So we will need one bit to describe this random variable. Okay, does that make sense? Right? Okay. Now, uh, let's generalize this idea, right? So let's consider the, let's see when the entropy for any uh, discrete uh, memory source or I mean the entropy of uh, when the entropy of any random variable, discrete random variable, will be maximized, right? So this basically means that let's consider let's let's consider a entropy. <coughs> so which is defined in this way. Right? So so now consider when this quantity will be maximized, right? Similar as before, right? So when the entropy is maximized, so basically it means that the uncertainty is maximized, right? So if we're really uncertain about it, so it basically means that every outcome will happen with the equal probability, right? So this means that this guy will be maximized when so all the probability will be identical equals to 1 over n basically right and in this way let's compute it right if this happened so let's see so this guy will equals to what so p k is one over n, and the log two p k is one over n, right? So, so now, so every term is the same, right? So this way, and uh, we can take this, uh, this one out by a negative sign. So, in this case, we have n multiply one over n, log two n, right? And then that will equals to log two n. Okay, so that is basically the max uh, the <coughs> the maximum uh, entropy that we could get for any ra discrete random variable with an alphabet of size capital N, right? Unit of that is bits. Again, this is kind of magic, right? So here, so why this means that we need this number of bits to represent the symbol, right? That uh, that is actually the the, the case.
Okay, so now let's see some example uh, to how to compute the entropy, right? How to control the entropy is one of the most important exercise that uh, we need to uh, we need to do, <clears throat> right? So by the way, so entropy is uh, the one is the most fundamental concept in information theory, right? And in this class, we'll only see entropy here. But uh, there are also other very important uh, concept uh, definitions in information theory, such as conditional entropy, mutual information, and so on, which are very, very useful and important. But uh, we're not going to discuss it uh, in this class. But if you're interested, feel free to attend another class called information theory. There, we're going to describe all this fancy and nice uh, concepts. Okay, so let's consider an example here. So let's say the output symbols from a DMS are actually QPSK. Okay, and then we have two questions. The first one is we want to find the maximum value of entropy of the source. Okay, and uh, the B is that find the entropy of the source when the uh, probability the PMF is given right <clears throat> when the or QPSK symbols occur with probabilities. 1, 8, 1, 8, 1 over 4, and uh, half. Okay, so let's solve this question. So A should be easy, right? The maximum value of entropy uh, happen when uh, all, the, all the outcomes has equal probability, right? So for the case of QPSK, we only have Four outcomes, right? In other words, so the alpha, the cardinality of the alphabet is basically four, right? And we just use the formula, so we just derived here. So the maximum entropy is nothing but log two n here. It since it's QPSK, m is just four, so in this case we have two, right? And the number, I mean the unit here is bit. So which is kind of like a magic, right? Right. We know for the QPSK, every symbol is just two bits, right? So basically, uh, so this is a pretty interesting. And uh, for the second problem, so we need to compute the entropy of this source, but for a given probability, right? So now, so what we need to use is this original definition of entropy. Right, so which is also actually given here, right here. So now we just use that formula. So this guy equals to one over eight, negative one over eight, log one over eight, minus one over eight, two, log one over eight, and uh, minus. Yeah, let's use another line. Minus one over four, log two one over four, minus one over two log two half right and you know we can cancel all the negative sign make it positive by doing the inverse of what uh, inside what is inside the log so we get one over eight log eight plus one over eight log eight plus one over four log four plus 1 over 2, log 2, right, log 2. And uh, so let's use the next page. 
So this equals to basically uh, 3 over 8, right? Because log 2 of 8 is 3 plus 3 over 8 plus 2 over 4 plus 1 over 2. So that is equals to. So if we have a common denominator, so it's 3 plus 3 plus 4 plus 4, right? In this case, we have, so that is, uh, uh, let's say that equals to 14 over 8, right? And of course, you can simplify that 7 over 4, and clearly that is less than 2 bits, so which is the maximum entropy here, right? Okay, very good. <clears throat> okay, so next, so let's consider uh, a set of uh, <clears throat> a set of uh, uh, symbols or a vector of symbols, right? <clears throat> so we consider a vector or a set of symbols from S one say s2 till s capital n right so then the question is that what is the entropy of this vector of symbols right so the, the way to consider this problem is that you know because they are all distributed you know on a ground sample space right so there's a joint distribution of this the, this um, this vector of random variables, right? So in other words, so we can consider the whole thing as a super symbol or a super random variable. Right? And if we consider the entropy of this of the entire thing, it's like from S1, S2 till S n. So, so we can show that because they are independent, right? So they're ID, right? If they're independent, so together, so that is basically equals to N multiply HS, right? So this actually is from the property that we just shown uh, for the self-information, right? Because of this guy equals the summation of all of them, right? So basically, we can easily show that uh, this property, this property will hold, right? Which is very nice. So, and uh, one important reason is that is that so all the s's they are independent. Right? Okay. Okay, very good. So, okay, given that, let's consider another example in this case, right? So we consider the DMS in the last example. Okay. And uh, for both cases A and B, right? So basically, we're gonna redo A and B in the case of consider more than one random variable, right? Okay, so if a super symbol, if a super symbol formed by combining two successive symbols right now we need to find the entropy of the super symbol
by using two approaches, right? The first approach is our formula. Right, so here basically, you know, we denote this vector of symbol as as race n, right? So that's a common notation we use. And uh, the second approach is basically by using the definition of entropy. The second way is exploration of all alphabet. So basically, I copy this from our book, right? So the example is actually in the book. Okay, so now let's uh, try to compute, see whether it works or not, right? They should get the same result. Right. For the part A, it's pretty straightforward. The first one is that, so it says two, right? So that's basically equals two times h of s, right? And in the first case, it's a QPSK with the maximum entropy, right? HS is two, as we computed before, if you still recall, right? That is basically four bits, right? And um, okay, and let's consider the the second exercise, which is computed brute forcefully, right? So HS two is nothing but HS one and as two, and in that case, we know that every symbol will happen with probability of one fourth, right? And we'll have two of them. So basically, uh, I mean, overall, so we're gonna have four times four, 16 cases, right? And each of the outcome will be, uh, will happen with the probability of one over 16, right? In this way, by using the formula of entropy, what we get is that so basically, we need to do a summation, summation over the number of symbols, right? So that's in total 16, okay? And for each of them, it'll happen with the probability of 16, right? And log one over 16, right? So that's a probability that each one should happen, right? Then if you compute it, this equals to log two 16, which is four bits, right? By using both of the methods, we obtain the exact same result, right? So for part B, so which is a given probability of one over eight, one over eight, one over uh, one over four, and uh, uh, one over two, right? So in that case, so you know for the first part. Right, that is again, this is easy. Right, we'll just use two times h of s, and we computed before, so it's two times one, uh, 14 over eight, so that'll equal to what 3.5 bits. Right, so the second approach is slightly uh, more tedious. Right, so now we need to, in order to use the, the formula, the, the definition of the entropy, so we need to compute the probability, the joint, the joint probability distribution or the joint PMF of these two symbols more explicitly. So this guy equals to basically the, the product of these two vector, right? So because they're independent, so it's also called a product distribution. So basically, you know, we have 16 cases in total and distribution, oh sorry, the distribution of that is basically we combine any two of them, right? So for example, the first one, right, happened with probability of one over 64. And then if we keep doing that, right, and one over eight, and this one, again, is one over 64. The next one, this one eighth, one over eight to, uh, times one over four is 1 over 32 and 1 over 16, right? So then we could keep writing this. So the second one is the same as the first uh, four. And then, so what we're going to have, 
uh, next is 1 over 4 times this 1 over 4 times 1 over 8, right? So that will give you 1 over 32, 1 over 32, and again, so 1 over 32, 1 over 16, 1 over 8. Last one is 1 over 16, 1 over 16, 1 over 8, 1 over 4. Right, so now we write the, the joint probability distribution of S1 and S2, and uh, next we're going to use the formula of entropy, right? So H S1, S2 equals 2. So we have 4, 1 over 16, right? So, so if we count it, so we have 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 of 1 over 64, right? So we have 4 of this guy, and then we have 4 of 32, right? Again, let's check it. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, and and we can continue. We could continue on this, right? So we can see that we have five, one over sixteen, and uh, lastly, or not lastly yet, so we have two of one over eight, and lastly we have one of one over four. Right, so now we could compute it. So if you compute it, right, which should not be uh, extremely hard to do, and you're gonna get what? 3.5 bits, right? It should be the same as before. Okay, very good. Okay, so this is the, the introduction of the uh, measure of the information or you know, the meaning of uh, entropy. Okay, uh, next. Uh, let's um, let's talk about uh, the lossless source coding theorem. So what we have been uh, talking so far is basically the meaning of entropy of a uh, DMS or basically a random variable, right? So, so although the unit is bit, right, like that, three point five bits, right? But uh, we're really we don't really sure, you know, the realistic meaning of that, right? So, what is the relationship between entropy and uh, the actual amount of the, or the actual number of bits that we need to use? to represent the source symbol, right? So we don't have the connection be the, between these two quantity yet, right? So so what I've seen before is that, okay, so let's say uh, if, uh, let's consider the, the previous example here. So let's say, okay, if it's a full qubit k, right? And if for each symbol we have, we transmit with equal probability. Okay, so in this case, the net, the entropy and uh, the, uh, the 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 and the bit per symbol they are equal, right? But uh, how about the general? So what is the general relation between the minimum number of bits to represent a source and the quantity of entropy? And obviously, what we would like is that so one should be equal to the other, right? So I mean. If those two are kind of equal, then they match, which is good, right? That's our goal. But uh, so far, we have not built this relationship yet, right? So we have, you know, we have whatever number of bits we represent our source, and we have a quantity, which is the measure of information. So uh, coincidentally, the unit of this measure, which is entropy, is also a bit, right? But this bit, and the mean of this bit, and the meaning of you know, you know, the other bit, you know, they could be slightly different, right? So the source coding theorem is basically to build the relation between these two quantity, right? So it's kind of magic, right? Okay. So before I introduce the source coding theorem, right? So basically, the, the source coding theorem is very easy. They basically say that okay, uh, 
you know, the minimum number uh, we need to represent a DMS is basically the entropy, right? But let's see how, you know, how we define this rigorously, right? So obviously, I'm not going to give the proof of it, right, if you're interested. So you can attend the class of information theory. Most likely, I will teach that class next time, which should be next spring, so if you're still here. Uh, but uh, so let's, I mean, at least give you the, the problem formulation and uh, you can, you know, learn a flavor of information theory and what is the exact meaning of what we said before, right? So, okay, so let's, in, let's consider this problem, I mean, the formal problem set up here, right? So what we do in practice is that we do not code symbol by symbol, right? So what we do code is we consider n symbols together, you know what that is, right? Like n before n is basically equal to two, right? And then we pass it through a encoder. So this, of course, this is a source encoder, right? And then, uh, so we have our coded information. So the coded information here is denoted by m here, right? So this is a calligraphic, yeah, you can, you know, this is a random variable of m, right? It's, it's not the cardinality, uh, the cardinality of m. Okay, so, and then we're going to have a decoder. And after decoder, so we're gonna recover our uh, transmit symbol. So which is, which is denoted by s hat of n, right? So what we want is we want s hat n equals to s n, otherwise there will be an error, right? Okay, so now let's see the problem definition. We consider a, a two to the power of n r n plus this source code of rate r bits per source symbol. Okay, let me explain what's the meaning of that. So basically, uh, let me use another color here. So basically, yeah, this number is basically the cardinality of this M here, right? So let's write it here. So basically, this means the cardinality of M, right? So, <clears throat> so in this case, so let's think so what is a bit per source symbol, right? So the bits per source symbol. So it's basically what, right? So in total, we have uh, uh, the cardinality of M symbols, right? So now let's assume that the cardinality of M equals to two to the power of an R, right? So basically the bit per symbol is nothing but log the cardinality, the cardinality of n inside, right? Or is 2 to the power of n r, right? And then we divide it by the number of symbols, right? That'll give you the bit per symbol, right? So that is basically equal to what? r, right? That's the meaning of this, right? The first 2 to the power of n r is basically uh, the cardinality uh, after the encoder. And uh, r is a bit per symbol. Right, n is basically uh, uh, is the number of uh, source symbol we're gonna code it together. Okay, very good. Okay, so so let's see. So this source code consists of encoder and the decoder. So that consists of. The first is an encoder. So an encoding function. 
or encoder, right? So the encoder is the nothing but a function. It's a function of n, right? So that is from the alphabet raised n, right? Because we consider n symbols together. So this alphabet, so they are going to map every symbol in this alphabet to a symbol here from 1 to up to what? In total, we have 2 to the power of nr symbols, right? So basically, it's 2 to the power of nr. So we need to take a floor here. Okay. And then that assigns an index n uh, as n, right? So because that is a source symbol, right? So it assigns this, or we say that is a code word length nr bits, right? Because that is eventually the number of bits that we need to transmit, right? That has to be an integer, okay? Assign this index to uh, each source and sequence as n. So this s raised n means it's called n sequence, okay? So this is a, a encoding function, and uh, we also need a decoding function, right? And the decoding function, a decoding function, or we call it a decoder, s hat in, okay? And here, at the receiver side, you know, so we basically receive the index n, right? So the index basically, I mean, the re what the re decoder did is that we're gonna map whatever we received from alphabet of this num of this many numbers, right, to our original alphabet, which is sorry, which is S N, right? So this is the set original alphabet and there's a possibility that we have error, right? So we, we didn't consider no error case yet. So it is possible that, you know, we claim an error, right? So that assigns estimate as hat n, right? And uh, that'll be in this alphabet or an error message e to each index n in this alphabet. Right, so that is the encoding and decoding. Okay, so now let's uh, deal with the, the error of the, you know, the, the, the error, right? So the probability of error for a this loss list source code is defined as when the decoding information is not the same as what you transmitted, right? So this is not the same as, so it's, this is not the same as what you, the same as the, the source information, right? Then we declare an error, right? And then um, we say a rate R is said to be 
achievable if there exists sequence of this code such that the limit when the length of the source symbol goes to infinity and the error will become zero, right? So this is so-called asymptotic error-free right it's not absolutely error free it's asymptotic error free and uh, you know the length i mean the the the, the more the n the bigger the n then basically the lesser the error right and eventually so we do not ask for the absolutely zero error right so what we ask is that so when n goes to infinity the error can be arbitrarily small of course you know zero error probability is one example of that right so, I mean, uh, one idea, you know, why we care about this is that, you know, here, the source coding is basically, basically compression, right? So let's say if there exists a symbol or outcome happen with extremely small probability, so we may just ignore it, right? We may just, you know, we don't, we assume that will never transmit it, right? So then, you know, the error probability for that particular uh, symbol would be very small, right? Because you know that happens extremely rarely, right? We may not even want to code it, right? So that's why you know we want to consider a symptotic error-free case, okay? And then now, so so basically, R is basically our source symbol. Uh, I mean, it's a source symbol rate, right? So the optimal rate. R, we denote it as R star, is basically the minimum. So we use infimum here, it basically means the minimum of all achievable rate. Okay, and let's recall the meaning of R is what? So R is basically like this, right? R is a bit per source symbol, right? So now it kind of coincides with what we uh, with what we discussed before, right? For example, uh, for example, in this QPSK example, the bit per symbol here is basically two bit, right? In this case, uh, I mean this is two bit, uh, so that coincides with the entropy, but. Uh, uh, you know, in other cases, you know, this does not co coincide with entropy, but this two bit is uh, the rate, uh, the, the the number of bits per symbol, right? So and uh, so the the source coding, the loss of this source coding theorem tells us that okay, so the minimum of R or R star is basically equals to the entropy, right? Let's write it here. So so now by using that. We could um, connect the rate R and basically the entropy, right? That's how they are connected. The source coding theorem. Okay, so this tells you that for a DMS source, yeah, DMS as P S S, right? So the minimum rate is actually equals to the entropy. Okay, so now it kind of makes sense that uh, you know the unit of entropy is bit, right? Actually, we can show that the minimum coding rate is equals to the entropy, right? So that is pretty nice. Okay. 
So our time is almost up. So maybe uh, let me just get started. Talk about Huffman coding. So Huffman coding is approach is a coding uh, method for oh. for DMS, right? So basically, the idea of Huffman coding is very simple. So I think the best way to illustrate Huffman coding is via an example. So let's see an example very quick, and we're gonna revisit this probably in our next class. Let's consider a source symbol with alphabet of three symbols, right? S0, S1, and S2. And let's say the probability distribution or the PMF is equal half, a third, one third, okay, one third. Okay, so the way we are doing Huffman symbol is uh, Huffman coding is as follows, right? So ideally, if for a symbol that, I mean, we cannot see this from this example, but we're gonna see that later. But the idea of Huffman coding is that for a symbol uh, with a lower probability, so we may want to use a longer code, right? Because that may not happen very frequently, right? So we want to give a shorter symbol to a node, uh, I mean, to a symbol happening with a higher probability, right? So the way we do that is that, so we're going to rank these three symbols from the highest probability to the lowest probability, right? As like that. So, but in this case, they're all the same. So it doesn't matter how we uh, rank them. So one and uh, two, but uh, we're going to redo this ranking for every iteration. Let's see how we do that, right? So we write this probability here. I mean, it doesn't matter because they're all happening with the same probability, right? So the way we do that is that, so on the bottom, so that happens with the smallest probability, right? Smallest meaning that they may not happen that frequently, right? So what do we do with that? We pick two of them and then combine it, right? Like this. So we combine these two guys. Okay, and now combine means add them together, right? So this two together will happen with the probability of three over two. Okay, so now we're gonna assign zero and one onto the edges, right? There's some rules, right? The rule could be on the top is zero, on the bottom is one. So we put a zero here and put a one here, right? So that's the first iteration. And now we combine the symbol of S1, S2. So now we have two symbols, right? So one symbol is S0 right here. And the other symbol is this new symbol with happening with the probability of three over two, right? So now we need to do the re-ranking. Right, so we do this. This symbol will run higher because that happened with the probability of three over two, but this symbol will happen with probability of three over one over three. So that's a lower ranking, right? And now, so we only have two, right? So then we're gonna combine these two, right, for sure. And then we get a one in the end. So now we're gonna again assign a number on the top and the bottom, right? On the top, so we're gonna assign zero on the bottom. We're gonna assign one. Okay, then we're done, right? So now, how can we see? Uh, how can we see the code word here, right? So the code word here is nothing but. So we're gonna we're gonna read from the left to the right, but write it from the left to the right, right? So let's see. So in the first case, as zero, right? So we we trace it here. There's only one here, right? There's only one. So basically, the code word of the S0 is just 1. And how about uh, the code word of S1? So we can see we have this, this is a path here and here, right? So here and here. So both of them are 0, right? But we're going to write it, you know, we read it from the right to the left, but write it from the left to the right. But in this, we cannot see here. It's all 0. But let's see what is S2 here. So S2 is that. So it's from here and here and then reach the end, right? So then we're gonna read it from the right to the left, which is zero, one, right? Zero, one. But when we write it, so we're gonna write from the left to the right, zero, one, right? So that's basically the rule here. Okay, very good. And uh, basically, 
So it means that when we see S0, we're going to transmit 1. When we see S1, so we transmit 0, 0. And we, when we see S2, we transmit 0, 1. Right? You can see that in the Huffman coding, so we transmit everything in terms of the binary, binary numbers, 0 and 1. OK? And uh, so we may compute uh, the average code word length in this case. Right, so that is equal to basically one third multiply one and the two times one third multiply two, right? So that will give you what? Five over three, which is equal to one six six seven. Right, that is a bit per symbol, right? Average bit per symbol, right? Uh, okay, so now let's compare this with the entropy. So we know the average bit per symbol has to be bigger than entropy. Right, but the minimum of that can equal to the entropy. So let's see the entropy in this case is basically uh, log 3, right? Because they have equal probability, that will give you 1.58 bits. 58, we we'll have another 5 here, bits. Right, and we can see that. So this number and this number, they are not extremely different, right? So, but uh, this number is truly bigger than this number, right? Which definitely makes sense, okay? So in our next lecture, so I'm going to continue talking about Huffman coding, right? And I'll give you some other examples and talk about uh, the advantage, disadvantage properties of Huffman coding. And uh, in the end, so I'll, I'll continue talking about con uh, coding for continuous source, like the speech coding, and then that'll be the end of this class. Okay, this is the entire course. Okay, so I'm going to assign you the homework nine, which is the very last homework today. So we will talk about uh, this homework in our next lecture. Okay, so hope you enjoy today's lecture and uh, please stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Let me know if you have any questions, right? I'm always, always available to talk over Zoom. Okay, thank you. See you.